But our place in God's puzzle, Romans 9, 25 through 33. I want to just say a little bit about this. Uh, I know uh, my mother always said this about her pastor. I would call her and she'd say, Oh, I went to church Sunday. He preached one of the best sermons he's ever preached. She said that every week. I'm here to tell you, all my sermons ain't good. <laughs> I still try, but they're all not good. And uh, I told her pastor that uh, right, right before her, her funeral service, and he got up and told that I told that. But, uh, but it's true. And, and going, through the book, going through books of the Bible, you come up on passages that's just difficult. Yeah, you know, I can't. I I really would like to skip over some of these things and get to one that really just gives you something. But you know, as I have preached through books of the Bible most of my ministry, when I when I first started, I was like probably most preachers. I was a hunt and peck preacher, and I tried to find those easy passages that I knew really well <laughs> that I. I could preach and, and get through. But as, as I preached and preached and preached, I, I just felt led of the Lord to, to preach more through books of the Bible. And so that's what I've done most of my ministry. And I think as, as you preach through books of the Bible, we get a better idea and a better view of what God is trying to say to us. Uh, I believe people need to realize that every aspect of Scripture is important. Amen. Every word, Amen. every chapter, every verse, everything in the Bible is important and valuable to us. And I, I think that, uh, you know, as I've committed myself to preach through books of the Bible, I've struggled at times when you come to passages like chapter 9 here of Romans, <laughs> and we're going to try to finish chapter 9 up today, that you come to some verses that are just really difficult and uh, hard to, to, to glean what God is, is wanting to say to us, and yet it's there very real plain and, and, and all. But... Uh, I just, uh, I just wanted to un for you to understand that all my sermons are not real good. I, I to <laughs> well, you know, I, I, told, I told a church back years ago, I said, don't leave. You know, the, the, the people will grab your hand and say, oh, it was such a good sermon today. And I thought, no, it wasn't. And I said, don't tell me I preach good sermons. And so then they got to coming out, and, and two or three guys were really bad about it. He said, I believe that's the worst sermon I ever heard. <laughs> but I tell you that to say this, that sometimes we're kind of drudging through some of these books. But they're all important. They're all, 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 of, all of these verses and all of these scriptures and all these chapters and all these words are important. But my commitment to God's word as truth is more important to me than anything else. I do not want to stand up here and give you anything that's not right. Amen. And so I pour a lot of time and effort into preparing these messages, even though they may not be good on some Sundays. I pour a lot of time and effort into giving you what God, what thus saith the Lord means. And so I hope that, that you understand that. And I think it, as a church, if we fail to hold up God's word as truth, we no longer be a church. We, this is God's word, and you come to hear God's word. And so with that said, I want us to jump into this message today. Israel was the chosen people of God they were to be God's chosen people and to be a witness to the world. And they failed big time. Failed big time. However, 
they, they failed, God did not exclude Israel from His plan. Because from the very beginning when He called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, He had a plan. He had a purpose. And even though they failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed and, failed and are still failing today, God still has a plan for Israel. And this is the whole point of these verses to point out how the chosen people of God were supposed to be. And that since they failed in God's sovereignty, He chose the Gentiles to be part of those chosen people. And they are. They are, they are part of His chosen people. And so in verse 24, if you'll go back and look at the latter part of last week's message, verse 24 says, Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. God's choice has always been his sovereignty. He has, he has sovereignly chose what he wanted to do. And he did that beginning with Abraham. Only those who respond to God's call will receive the gift of salvation, though. Salvation is by invitation only. By invitation only. It comes to us completely undeserved. None of us deserve God's salvation. None of us deserve to be part of God's family. With that said, let's look at our text today about our place in God's puzzle and see how Israel's unbelief is consistent, first of all, with God's prophetic revelation. To back up that statement that God also calls Gentiles, Paul quoted two verses from the prophet Hosea. Several hundred years before Jesus' birth, Hosea told of God's intention to bring Gentiles into his family after the Jews would reject him. And notice verse 25 and 26. It says, And he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in, this, in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they shall be called sons of the living God. You see, God was not surprised by Israel's rejection. God is not surprised by anything because He is in control of everything. He knows everything. Israel thought they alone were God's chosen because of their lineage and their laws. But God's plan was never to save only the Jews. It was never His plan just for the Jews. His plan was to save all people from all nations. In Acts 22 and verses 20 and 21 I went back and looked at this because Paul got this message, got this message from God while they were stoning Stephen. And in Acts 22, 20 and 21, it says, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then he, God, said to me, Depart. For I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And Romans 10, 13 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, Jew or Gentile. Now verse 25 is a quotation from Hosea 22, 23. And 20, verse 26 is a quotation from Hosea 1, 10. Now, if you know the story of Hosea, I, I love the story of Hosea. I went to a, I went to a uh, pastor's conference one time. It wasn't uh, at uh, First Baptist Jacksonville. It was another pastor's conference. And uh, this, this pastor, this preacher uh, shared a monologue of Hosea. 
He come in dressed like Hosea, walking down the middle of the church, and he's greeting people and all, and he told the story of Hosea. I've always loved Hosea. But Hosea had married Gomer, and Gomer was represented Israel. Gomer was a prostitute. And Israel had prostituted God. And so it, Hosea and Gomer, they got married. God told him, him to marry her. They had a child together, and they named that child Jezreel. And that means God sows. God so, and a sower sows seeds everywhere. God sows. But the next two children that came into their life was not Hosea's. But Hosea obeyed God and named these two children. He named, named the second child Lo, Lo Ruhamah and the third child Lo, uh, Lohami, meaning, the, uh, meaning not my people and not my beloved. So Hosea's situation and his children's names pictures God's attitude toward Israel. They had not turned away from him. They had turned away from him and were no longer called his people or his beloved. And if you remember the story of Hosea in chapter 3, God told Hosea, God told Hosea to go and purchase his wife. Bring her back. And Hosea went down into that slave market and redeemed his wife, purchased her back as she stood in that slave market naked and nasty and ugly. He redeemed her. And this is a picture of what Christ, God did for Israel. Even though Israel had, had prostituted God, he bought her back. He redeemed her back. And, and the picture is of when he brought Israel back from Babylonian captivity and brought them back to Israel. Israel has always and will always be in God's plan. Always. Israel is still God's bride and has been redeemed by the relentless love of God. And then in verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. And there is a, there is a Jewish population in every major city of the world. They are scattered all over this world. But he says, the remnant will be saved. Even though they are like the sands of the sea, the sands that are sowed everywhere, only a remnant will be saved. God's sovereign choice always includes some Jews. And there is Jews. I remember Carmelita witnessing to a person on the airplane one time, and she was I mean, she she buttonholed him because she was asking him if he had ever asked Christ to save him and all this stuff, and and uh, he had told her he was a Jew, and he said yes, ma'am. And she kept telling him, "You're not. You're lost. You need to get saved." But he was he was a Messianic Jew. He knew Jesus Christ. But she kept trying to win him to the Lord. But there is some Jews out there today that, that, that are saved, that, that love Jesus Christ, have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is a remnant. But Isaiah prophesied that only a small number, a remnant, of God's original people, the Jews, will be saved. And let me say this. I have said this all my, my ministry. And the Bible makes this very plain. It says, all them that call me Lord, Lord shall not enter in. I've always said there's going to only be a remnant of people. Heaven is plenty big for anybody that wants to go. But there will only be a remnant of people that will be saved. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 said, Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. 
because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Just like there, they will be a remnant of Jews that will be saved, they will be a remnant of Gentiles that are saved. Paul saw that with that advent of Christ, those not known as God's people were becoming his people by God's mercy and grace shown through Christ. Paul saw this happening in every city where he preached. Even though in every city that he went to preach, he preached to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. But relatively few accepted his message. Quoting from Isaiah 10, 22 through 23 and chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul explained there in verse 28 and 29, he says, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord Almighty, or the Lord of hosts, had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have become like Gomorrah. So it's good that that, that little remnant of a seed stayed because it led us and pointed us to the grace and mercy of God. What Paul is saying, if God had not spared a remnant of faithful believers, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you know anything about Sodom and Gomorrah, they, they cannot even be found anymore. He wiped them from the face of the earth. They're gone. Nothing was left. But not, God never completely destroyed his people. Never. But the application for today is clear. Only a remnant of Jews believe and they together with the Gentiles are the called of God. Today, Gentiles make up the majority of the church. Now, what does all of this prove? That God was not unjust in saving and judging others because he was only fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies given centuries ago. He would have been unjust if he did not keep his own word. Unjust. But even more than that, those prophecies show that God's election has made possible the salvation of the Gentiles and tells us and gives us evidence of the grace and mercy of God. At the Exodus, God rejected the Gentiles and chose the Jews so that the Jews might get the gospel to the Gentiles. That doesn't make sense, does it? But that's God's plan. So far, Paul had defended the character of God by showing his faithfulness, his righteousness, and his justice. Israel's rejection had not canceled God's election. He had only, it only proved that he was true to his character and true to his purpose. God had a purpose for Abraham when he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was birthing a nation. And even though that nation was not true to God many, many, many times, and still is not true to God today, he still loves them. They still have a purpose and plan in his, in his mind. As also, Israel's unbelief is consistent, secondly, with God's prerequisite of faith. Paul realized that his teaching was not making sense to his Jewish audience. Kind of like what I said this morning in the beginning. Sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to understand. How could it be that he acknowledged, the acknowledged experts in righteousness and they knew the law? They knew the law frontwards and backwards and sideways and every imaginable way. How could God bar them because they were righteous 
while those who are ignorant of righteousness were welcomed as God's children. Paul contrasts the way of faith by the way of the law in verse 30. He says there in the first part of verse 30, he says, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness? The gospel was preached to both Jews and Gentiles, but it was being accepted far more by Gentiles than it was Jews. And they couldn't understand that because they were living according to the law. They were living according to God's word. And so what was the problem? Look at the latter part of verse 30. It says, even the righteousness of faith. They were coming by faith and not by works. We have a lot of people today that are trying to work their way to heaven. They're trying to give enough. They're trying to do enough. They're trying to be good enough. But salvation is totally by faith. Verse 31 says, But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. In contrast to the Gentiles, the Jews tried, they worked hard at being what God wanted them to be. But the law had become oppressive. And we have, we have denominations today that, that, that are trying to work their way to heaven. They're trying to work their way to salvation. They want to do this ritual and this ritual and we want to do this and we want to do that and we're good to people. We want to give all we can to this and we want to do all that. You can't work your way. They had incorrectly understood righteousness in terms of works. They could not keep the law perfectly. Thus God could not accept them. And verse 32 says, why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. Instead of admitting that they could not keep the law and pursuing righteousness by faith, the Jews just kept trying to work. I've got a guy that I told you about him. He comes by and he's, uh, he sprays our, our building for, for bugs and insects and, and everything. And, and he's a works salvation person. And he comes and he, he wants to debate with me on, on, on this work salvation and salvation by grace through faith. I finally told him the other day, he said, you might as well shut up. You're not going to change me. And I'm not going to change you. So there's no need in us talking about this. I just believe you're wrong. <laughs> But there's people out there today that think they're, they're, they're works. And there's many denomination that, denominations that way, that we can work our way to heaven. Thus, the Jews became more dedicated to the law than they did to God. The Jews did not see that the scriptures, the Old Testament taught salvation by faith and not by human effort. The point Paul made in the first part of his letter, that's what he kept trying to tell them. And then there in the latter part of verse 32, it says, For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was not what they expected. You see, they expected an earthly king. They expected somebody to heal all of their problems and to, to be a good leader for them, a, a physical earthly leader. And Jesus didn't meet their expectations. And in so doing, they missed their only way of salvation. Some people today still stumble over Christ. They say, well, it's got to be more to it than just by faith. I've always said, I could sell Jesus quicker than I can give him away. When you, tell, when you tell people, you don't have to do nothing for it. All you've got to do is by faith receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The next thing out of their mouth is there's got to be more to it than that. You see, God, God made it real simple for us. 
He made it real easy for us. He knew if he made it too difficult, we wouldn't get it. And he made it easy and we didn't get it. <laughs> so you can understand why he tried to make it as easy as he could. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people still do it. Others stumble over Christ because His values are opposite of the world's. Because they want to live like the world and yet be a follower of Christ. And you can't do that. I am a full believer of a Pauline experience. When you really get Jesus like Paul got Jesus, you are going to be changed like Paul. He had a complete conversion change. He, he was converted totally inside and out. Christ asks for us to humble ourselves before Him. Admit that we can't do anything. And admit that we are nothing. And that He is everything. He requires obedience and many refuse to put their will at his disposal and it causes them to stumble sometimes we are like those people who try to achieve god's approval by like the jews keeping the laws i have i know i've known people through the years you know they can quote you scripture after scripture after scripture after verse after verse after verse but live like the devil but they think because they know the word or they know about God that they're all right. Paul's words sting. God's plan is not for those who try to earn their God's favor. Just being good. But we earn God's favor by receiving God by faith. By grace through faith. The only way. Only by putting our faith in what Jesus has done will we be saved. And then in verse 33 he says, As it is written, and Paul quotes here from Isaiah 28, 16, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. The stone refers to the righteous remnant and to Christ. And then he says in the latter part of that verse, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. When we put our trust in Christ, we do not need to fear putting our faith in the wrong place. When we've placed our feet on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be confident of salvation. That's the only way that you can be confident. Any form of rejection will result in our stumbling over him, resulting in judgment. But trusting submission to him will gain us what we could never hope to gain by ourselves. It will gain us salvation. I'm glad I don't have to work for my salvation, that I don't have to do anything. It blows me away, and it should blow us all away that God would even look kindly and favorably down on any of us. But He does. In closing, let me ask you this. And this may confuse you too. Are you stumbled? Or are you humbled? Are you stumbled... Or are you humbled? That's the, that's the question. Don't stumble, but humble yourself. Because God is still calling out His children. He's still calling them. And our, our mission as Gentiles in this world is to keep getting the message out. And for the first time in a long, long time, our convention is decreasing in baptisms. We're decreasing terribly in membership. 
And why, we, why we're decreasing is we are forgetting to tell people about Jesus. We're forgetting that. We've got to get back to it. You've got to get back to winning your family. That's the first, that, that's your first mission field. Your entire family. Your, 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 you, your, your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and on out. Your, your whole aunts, uncles. Once you get all of them, then knock on your neighbor's door. Go to your neighbors. And then when you've won all your community, then you branch out to your other areas just outside your community. And you just keep branching out. What we have done, and I'm a Southern Baptist from the tip of my toes to the tip of my, what little hair I got left. We have made it too easy for people to think they are reaching and doing the Great Commission by reaching in our hip pockets and reaching in our purses and giving out some money that we're doing something through the cooperative program and we are, re we are reaching the world for Jesus. We are failing because we are failing to reach our families. We are failing to reach our neighbors. We're failing to reach our communities. But we want to give so we can reach somebody over yonder. I just told somebody there a while ago, I went to this one church and interviewed. This wasn't even in my notes. <laughs> but I interviewed for this church, and they were out in the middle of nowhere. Carmelita, you remember it. Mexico Baptist. And they, was get, they told us they was giving 25 or 30% of their offerings to missions. Well, they had already told me what they're paying the preacher. That was in poverty. And we were so far out in the country, Carmelita couldn't even find a job to help me. And I looked at her and I said, "Honey, you think I need to tell them? She said, don't do it. But I've never listened to her. And I just told them, I said, I want to tell you something. Your first missionary is your pastor. And if you're not going to take care of him like you ought to take care of him, it is useless for you to send all that money over there to a foreign field. They never did call me to be their pastor. But I'll tell you the same thing. Because one of these days you're going to get you a full-time preacher here that lives here on this field. And you pay him. You be good to him. Because he's your first missionary. I mean, it looks good that we help all these other organizations. But we have got to first reach Felda. Reach our families in Felda. And then we'll get out here in Henry County. Then we might even go up in LaBelle and get all them saved. Over Fort Myers and get all them saved. Come to Cape Coral. They need saving too. I got lost neighbors all around me. <laughs> they wonder why we get up on Sunday morning and leave. They know that the Moose Club is not open. <laughs> the Country Club's not going. Let me ask you again. Are you stumbled or are you humbled? That's the question.